Our guest this weekend is our own Dr. Joe Salerno, and we are talking about monetary policy and gold on the heels of yet another GOP presidential primary debate. And it appears that not even Rand Paul is going to be able to generate much interest in the Fed or in monetary policy generally in the 2016 cycle. Now, Ted Cruz has, for his part, at least alluded faintly to the idea of a gold standard, uh, for which he was promptly savaged by the media, both left and right, for even bringing it up. But as Joe and I discuss, a gold standard is hardly something that needs to be imposed on anyone. It's something that can develop in the marketplace on its own, and it can develop alongside competing currencies. In other words, gold could be used as money in America alongside the U.S. dollar. We also talk about how the Fed's interest rate targeting and really the entirety of its open market operations only serve to obscure what's really going on with the most important metric, which is the money supply. And finally, we talk about how to sell, like Ron Paul did so successfully, some form of anti-Fed populism to the general public. So stay tuned for a great interview with Dr. Joe Salerno. Dr. Joe Salerno, welcome back once again to Mises Weekends. Last night we had yet another GOP primary debate and not much talk of the Fed or monetary policy, though I do notice that Ted Cruz has at least alluded to a gold standard in some of his public statements. And of course, he's been savaged for it. Let me give you sort of a representative criticism. This is from the New York Times a few months back, and I'm quoting them. Tying the dollar to an arbitrary quantity of shiny metal binds policymakers' hands, robbing them of their discretion to act. The central bank can't adjust the money supply to counteract crises or prevent them. So give us your thoughts on this kind of criticism, which we hear so often with respect to the gold standard. Right. They're, they're very fearful of, of gold. Um, there's a, a gold, an orophobia, which is the uh, Greek word for, for, for you know, fear of gold uh, out there. And they, the left exploits that. Uh, in fact, uh, their premise, the implicit premise of, of, of what you just read, is that um, the money supply should be manipulated by the political authorities. Uh, in response to developments in the economy, when in fact uh, money grew up as part of the economy and adjusts as any other good does, like apples, um, automobiles, McDonald's hamburgers, the production, supply and value are determined by the market. And the same thing is true of money and should be true of money. And also gold is it's good that gold is a, is a golden handcuff. I mean, that is that it binds politicians whose propensity is always to increase spending and to do so in a way that does not raise taxes. And that means printing money. Right. Well, the criticisms of gold, of course, aren't just uh, on the left. They come from the right as well. But respond to this general criticism that because the supply of gold can't just be increased at will, that this suppresses economic growth overall. Yeah. Well, the whole point is that... Um, uh, if we step back just for a moment and, and look at economic growth, uh, economic growth in history under the gold standard has occurred via the f the increase in the value of money. That is a fall in prices. Now, that doesn't bring about defla deflation does not bring about depression and unemployment. In fact, uh, even mainstream economists today uh, realize that there's something called a good deflation. And that's where you have technological improvement, increases in, in investments in capital goods that raise productivity of workers and therefore lower costs. So prices fall step, well, you know, hand in hand with the fall in costs through competition. And this is exactly what happened in the periods period of the greatest growth in U.S. history from around 1879 through 1896. We had a fall of, of, of prices from 2 to 3 percent and um, one of the most rapid increases in GDP growth in, in, in American history. You know, Joe Rothbard makes the very important point that unlike other commodities, an increase in the amount of money in an economy doesn't confer any social benefit. We don't have any new goods or services as a result. Why do you think that this point is not discussed or under, better understood? Well, because they're always thinking that that money is, is really exogenous to the economy. It's not part of the economy. It's a measuring rod. And so measuring rod should be stabilized. So if prices fall, we should increase the money supply so that we have a stable standard of value. OK, and that's, of course, false. Money's like any other good. Its value is determined by supply and demand. It doesn't stand outside the market economy. Even fiat money has its value determined in the market economy, even though the government monopolizes supply or the central bank monopolizes supply, individuals' demands interact with that supply to determine the value, or, or uh, which is the inverse of the price level. We always hear this fear that Austrians in particular would want to impose some kind of gold standard on the economy when in fact, 
Uh, we would just like to see gold operate as one kind of money available in society. And, the, and gold has evolved over millennia as a popular form of money. It doesn't need to be imposed on anybody. Right, exactly. Um, it, it, it took, as you said, millennia for for human beings to hit upon uh, something that is the the uh, means of, uh, or let's say, medium of exchange that is least bad. I mean, gold is not perfect, but gold does combine those qualities in uh, a good that you want for a medium of exchange, durability, and so on. You, you know the whole list. So, um, gold. Uh, when we say uh, restoring the gold standard, we just mean restoring market money. Money, restoring the uh, power of the market to t determine the value, the quantity, and even the composition of money. We don't necessarily believe a gold standard is going to always be the, the money. I mean, we would be willing to, I mean, if the market chose silver, that would be fine, or, or some other commodity. But why couldn't we have a world, as Ron Paul suggested, where we truly have competing currencies, where governments continue to issue fiat currency, which is used, where some sort of gold-backed currency is used, perhaps where a cyber currency like Bitcoin is used? and just let the marketplace decide. Now, I agree with that. I think that's the first step back to a sound money. We have to see what the market chooses, what individuals choose and individual businesses and households decide to hold and use in exchange. So yes, let's allow full competition, get rid of all taxes, capital gains, taxes, sales taxes, excise taxes on gold and silver, and allow them to compete on an equal footing with not only the US dollar, but, but other foreign fiat currencies. But let's have open competition. Now, in 2012, Ron Paul managed to have success in making monetary policy a populist issue. It seems that neither Rand Paul nor Bernie Sanders have had as much success in bringing monetary policy into public debate. If you were advising a presidential candidate, how would you tell him to talk to the public about monetary policy? I would suggest that they point out that monetary policy is now being made by unaccountable bureaucrats, bureaucrats whose appropriations are not uh, whose budgets are not determined by congressional appropriations, who uh, have no oversight. So I think the first step, and it's a step that right and left can unite on, is, is to reestablish constitutional money in the sense that Congress now oversees the Fed. I, I think the ind so-called independence of the Fed be taken away and that it be folded into the Treasury. Uh, and then that's the first step back in a populist program back toward a gold standard. You would still have fiat money, but now the Fed would not, as, as part of the Treasury, the money would simply be printed up to pay for ver ver expenditures of government. There would not be this arcane process of money creation that goes through open market operations, goes through the cr credit markets, and actually distorts interest rates. This would, the, the, uh, if Congress controlled money, then there would be no distortion of interest rates. They simply print up money when you know, we had deficit. Uh, this was an old plan put forward by Milton Friedman, and I, I don't think it's, it's um, the uh, end all and be all, but it's the, only the very first step back in a populist program. So it's not that you advocate some form of neo-greenbacker position per se, but rather you see some incremental benefit to bringing transparency to money creation from this kind of system in the Treasury. Yes. Incremental, yes. But Joe, as you know, not all the criticisms of gold and its role in the economy come from the left. We also have people on the right and, and libertarians who talk about things like NGDP targeting, which is currently in vogue. You know, what do you think is behind this? Do you think uh, libertarians and some on the right view this as an incremental step, or do you think they, they really believe that uh, inflation targeting or GDP targeting is the answer? Well, no, I, I don't. I, I think it's more wonkish. I, I think that the libertarian economists or the Austrian, some Austrian economists, so-called, who support these sorts of um, nominal GDP um, targets, um, they are victim as much as, 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 as the rest of the population to the very pervasive and effective propaganda of the Fed, that it should be independent. So given that we have fiat money, so they're, they're saying, okay, we have fiat money now, the best um, that we can do is is to have the Fed target some some you know follow some rule, uh, target GDP or what uh, nominal GDP or whatever it is. Whereas my view would be no, the, the the first step is to is to get rid of the independence of the Fed, make the politicians who are directly um, elected make them the ones that bear responsibility if we have inflation. And I think there you uh, moving in that direction, you'll it'll be an easier path back to the gold standard. Since the crash, the last crash of 2008, we've really been in an unprecedented time for monetary policy, and people of the Fed will even freely admit this. What do you think will be the ultimate harm of this quadrupling 
of the Fed's balance sheet in a period of just seven or eight years? Well, it depends. If the economy picks up um, and and interest rates begin to rise, interest rates on the market begin to rise uh, above what what the Fed's paying on excess on riskless excess reserves, then you'll have those reserves lent out. Now, the the, inter- the, the money supply is increasing at six seven percent per year. It's it's increasing substantially. Um, it's increased from eight to ten percent for a few years there after the financial crisis, and now it's settled between six to eight percent per year since two thousand and ten or so. So that's a, I mean, some of that money, some of the reserves are being transformed into money via fractional reserve banking. And the problem is, if indeed we have um, a, a movement upward in the economy, the, the banks will then begin to loan out more of those reserves and, and the rate of increase in the money supply will be, will be greater. And then the, the Fed will have to begin to unwind its position, has, will have to reduce its balance sheet. And it's going to have to sell some of the mortgage-backed securities, which still aren't very good, and, and that may cause a, a, a market um, plunge. Joe, do you think Janet Yellen is a true believer, someone who always thinks that there's another round of QE or interest rate lowering, or do you think she understands on some level that there are limits to what the Fed can do? Yeah, I think Yellen is somewhat of a true believer. She's worried, but yet um, if you read her, uh, which, her statement after the last Fed meeting, basically she believes in a very crude type of Phillips curve. I mean, she doesn't think that the increase in the money supply is what causes inflation. If you follow her reasoning in that in, in that press conference, what she basically says is, well, look, the, the labor market is strengthening, but it's not it isn't strong enough yet to, to bring about inflation, the inflation that we want, 2% per year. So she's got sort of a cost push view of inflation, that you lower interest rates, you stimulate business investment, you get more workers hired, and that puts an upward pressure on, on wages. And then we get the inflation that we desire at 2%. She doesn't see any sort of connection, or at least she didn't state one, between uh, the increase in the money supply and and, and an increase in prices directly. So they've really um, regressed in the last few years. Um, that is, Fed, Fed officials and macroeconomists back towards uh, the Phillips curve notion. And I find that very troubling. Well, on a limited scale, we have a model in Japan. You might call it a cautionary tale. They have been suppressing interest rates for decades, and they've seen no real economic growth at all. How, how do mainstream economists explain Japan? Would they simply say, well, the uh, U.S. is different because we're the world's reserve currency? Well, they'd be like Paul Krugman and say, well, there's not enough of it. Uh, Interest rates have to be lower. We have to have more QE. And we have to have, and of course, they had big deficits, which the U.S. Um, more or less talked them into, into. And none of that has worked. But, but they would say, well, it's just not enough. We don't have enough of the Keynesian medicine uh, injected into the victim. Not the patient, the victim, because eventually, uh, you know, Japan is is, is going to go back into into sort of. A, I mean, it's never really come out of its its great recession. Joe, about a month ago, the financial press was just mesmerized by Janet Yellen's announcement that the Fed would target a quarter percentage point increase in the Fed funds rate. You know, it all seems so complicated. There seems like there's so much obfuscation. How should we, as lay people, think about all this talk about the Fed funds rate? How does it affect us? Okay, it, it's not okay. It, it it can be traded between banks, but it's not only created between banks. I mean, the banks can loan those those reserves out, and they do loan the reserves out. Okay, right now they're 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 holding a great proportion of them. Look, the Fed funds market in which banks trade reserves between one another is a bogus market. It's created by the Fed. What are they trading? They're trading something that's really non-scarce, uh, that can be cre- created by one stroke uh, of a keyboard in cyberspace. And they trade that between one another. So in, in my view, um, this, these boosts in, in the interest rate, that ju- one that just occurred and four that is supposed to occur in t- 2016, and that yesterday Larry Summers said, oh, I don't think we can stand uh, four increases of a quarter of a point each. Um, that is, it's bogus. What, what, what's really important is, look, the effect on the money supply. Okay, the Fed funds rate, the movements in the Fed funds rate have no effect on the economy. In fact, there's only 300 transactions per day in the Fed funds market, totaling about um, $50, $50 billion. In one day, $740 billion worth of bonds are traded in real markets. That's where the interest rate is set. The Fed funds market has no effect on, on setting the interest rate or on inflation, okay? Um, the open market operations that inject those reserves are only effective to the extent that those reserves are lent out. And for various reasons, including paying 
um, uh, interest rates, uh, paying an interest rate for excess reserves. That is the Fed doing that. Uh, that those reserves are being um, stopped from going, getting injected into, into the market and multiplying uh, into a, an increase in the money supply. So, so we're focusing on the wrong thing, is, is my point. But to go back to the Fed's balance sheet, I mean, it is unimaginable under any kind of, let's say, gold standard system that the Fed would be able to quadruple its balance sheet over a period of about seven or eight years. Do you think people really understand how unprecedented this is and what kind of environment the Fed is trying to operate in? Yeah, it's completely unprecedented. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, under the gold standard, we all, all the base money, all the gold in the that has been uh, uh, mined is still in existence, except except for for the, the that has been used in industrial uses or been lost at sea. So, the production of gold in any given year is a very small proportion of uh, of the so called monetary base. So, inflation, if there is any, is extremely moderate, and usually there is no inflation because the amount of goods and services in a dynamic capitalist economy is increasing at a greater rate than the influx of, of new gold. Joe, one last question for you today. Apart from lay people and the general public, do you think economists really understand how unprecedented our situation is and how dangerous what we fear could be an unraveling of the U.S. dollar really is for the American economy? No, I, I don't think so. And I, I think it's being obscured um, and it's being obscured through, through some of the language that is used uh, and, and, and the focus on, on the Fed funds rate rather than on the money supply. This whole this, this focus of, of you know, raising the rates. OK, well, look, if there's no change in the money supply, that has no effect on anything, raising the Fed funds rate or lowering the Fed funds rate. It's the reserves that actually are lent out by banks that then bring about uh, an increase in the money supply and, and potential inflation. And at the same time, of course, distort interest rates. Because when the banks lend the money out, the only way they can get additional borrowings is by lowering the real market interest rates. And then that gives entrepreneurs the incorrect signals, and then they begin to overinvest in, in so-called capital goods. And then we have, get a distortion in the real economy that needs to be liquidated later on via recession. Well, I don't think we're going to get this kind of technical discussion uh, in the remainder of the 2016 GOP presidential debates. Joe Salerno, thanks so much for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend.